This is a special report from ABC News Digital. Hello, everyone. I'm Ty Hernandez in New York with this ABC News Digital special report. Big election victories last night are forcing pundits to forecast even further. And the name on the tip of everyone's tongue today, Chris Christie, the New Jersey governor, took the Garden State by a big margin. In his victory speech last night, Governor Chris Christie challenged Washington, saying lawmakers should look to New Jersey as a functioning government. That if we could do this in Trenton, New Jersey, maybe the folks in Washington, D.C. should tune in their TVs right now, see how it's done. I guess there is open bar tonight, huh? <laughs> Welcome to New Jersey. Um, my pledge to you tonight is I will govern with the spirit of Sandy. I did not seek a second term to do small things. I sought a second term to finish the job. Now watch me do it. All right, a very determined Chris Christie. And let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein to talk about his victory and other election results from last night. Hello, Rick. Hi there. Yeah, I've never seen a, a, a victory celebration that, that doubled as a campaign announcement <laughs> quite like that before. Hello, Clearly, Washington. <laughs> a little bit more than New Jersey on his mind. A four-year term, but there's uh, something else that's going to happen in the middle of that term that he may be thinking about. All right, yeah, so he's got the big mo. Uh, what now? What next? He is going to begin to take this message around the country, and he's going to do it directly under the auspices of the Republican Governors Association. Fortunately for him, he's going to be the new chairman of that group. It's going to put him into contact with governors around the country, fundraisers, give him a head start. And mostly he's going to use a bigger meta megaphone than ever to, 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 to make the case that he is the antidote to all of the very various Republican woes right now. Someone asked me if he is now the most prominent person in the Republican Party. He is the head of the Christie wing of the Republican Party. He is the man at the, at, at the center of this. And there's going to be an entire debate that revolves around his candidacy, but he is in the driver's seat. That doesn't mean you win the nomination. It means that there's lots of things that happened before then, but it does mean that uh, there is no single Republican who had a better 2013 than Chris Christie. Capped it last night with a resounding victory. All right, he did win by that large margin, but skeptics point out he was an incumbent and there was low turnout. Does that play into this at all? Yeah, he'll take those he'll take those critiques. He doesn't have a choice about being the incumbent. And in terms of turnout, look, he was able to engineer things so that he won uh, across demographic groups. He carried Latinos. That's virtually unheard of. He carried women, even though he is uh, in, in not a supporter of abortion rights. And he also had a female Democratic opponent who had a lot of national uh, attention from groups around that. So he was able to win a soaring, searing victory. He won every county in the state. He won across income levels, uh, across demographic groups. It was an impressive win any way you measure it. He'll take anyone saying that uh, not enough people voted in New Jersey, New Jersey's Democratic, whatever, whatever reason you want to give for the reason that he won, he is able to say he won and he won big. Are we going to see any big changes in Chris Christie? I mean, he was loud and proud last night and he is who he is, but is there a concern about how he might play in Iowa, for example? Yes, and his team is already cognizant of that, and they know that if he, if he decides to run for president, he's going to have to do it in a way that challenges a lot of the conventional wisdom about the early states. Rudy Giuliani tried to do it in 2008, bigger star than Chris Christie, I would argue, at the time, and he fell flat. He never got it started. They're saying they won't make those mistakes. At the same time, he is more conservative than Rudy Giuliani in some ways on some social issues. He may not be as outspoken on those as on fiscal issues, but he plans to burnish those credentials. He's now free. The point is to now run toward the right. He has gotten the center. He has gotten exactly what he needed out of New Jersey, which is to run up the score, win a big victory that propels him onto the national stage. George W. Bush had a similar circumstance where he won a big reelection in 1998 and then ran, turned around and ran for president in 2000. Chris Christie has a three-year head start instead of a two-year one. Let's move now to Virginia, the other gubernatorial race that a lot of people were watching. Victory for Democrat Terry McAuliffe. What do we take away from that? A couple of things. First of all, it's a defeat for the Tea Party movement. Ken Cuccinelli, the Republican candidate, was of the Tea Party, a strong social conservative. Terry McAuliffe, 
not uh, not anyone's idea of a of, of a perfectly suited candidate for any state. He's a longtime party fundraiser and fixer and friend of the Clintons. A lot of baggage around his business dealings, around his fundraising exploits. But he won. He won, however, by only a few points. Polls had shown that this would be a seven or eight point race. He ended up winning by less than three points. Uh, indications that the unpopularity of the Obama health care law contributed to a, a narrower gap. Good turnout among Cuccinelli supporters. But the bottom line, a win is a win. And there's is it going to be a Democratic governor in the state of Virginia? It's the first time that the party inside the White House is getting the governor's mansion in Virginia since not back in 1973. Does this signify a shift in the Virginia vote, or is it still too soon to tell? Virginia is definitely changing, and now there's still the attorney general's race in that state that it's, it's unresolved, but the potential for all the statewide offices and both Senate seats to be occupied by Democrats, that's virtually unheard of in recent history. Uh, Virginia has a Democratic tradition that ended in the 1960s, and it started to go Republican. Now it is going back in another direction. If you look at where Chris Christie, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at where Terry McAuliffe got his votes in, in Northern Virginia, for instance, uh, that is a fast-growing and fast-changing part of the state. It is not your father's Virginia. Maybe it's your grandfather, Virginia, in terms of the Democratic leanings. But things are changing there, and uh, it's going to be a battleground on the presidential level. The fact that President Obama won both times that he ran there is something that people have to take note of. And, Rick, moving on to New York City, we have a new mayor here, Democrat, which shouldn't come as a surprise, but he's the first one that's been elected in 20 years. We're talking about Bill de Blasio, who six months ago struggled for fourth place in the mayor's race, and he won by a landslide. That's right, and he won it by being the most liberal of the candidates, essentially, talking about income inequality, talking about the need for social justice. And this is after 12 years of Michael Bloomberg and eight years of Rudy Giuliani before that and, and their own unique leadership styles. This is the, really the, the, the city, which is a pretty liberal bastion, uh, reasserting that and moving back in that direction, going with de Blasio in the primary. He won against better-funded candidates uh, who had uh, more name recognition coming into the race. And then he just swamped the general election. The Republican candidate, Joe Loda, really had no chance. It was a, a blowout of historic proportions for Bill de Blasio. And the mayor of New York becomes a national figure almost automatically. So we're going to hear a lot more about him and about this experiment in New York City with a more liberal style of governance. We talk about Bloomberg fatigue here in New York City, someone who had an unprecedented third term uh, in recent history. Uh, a lot of people like the job he did, but were tired of the man. Is this going to be a difficult road for de Blasio to navigate? Yeah, it's interesting because Bloomberg leaves with a degree of popularity, but you could not read de Blasio's win in the primary as other thing, anything other than a, a repudiation of the high-flying Bloomberg years. Uh, this was a, a, described as a new gilded age in New York, and that's what uh, Bill de Blasio was running against. So it's possible that he can, de he can tap into that and, and keep a coalition together, but once this starts meaning higher taxes on upper-income earners, uh, it could hurt a real estate market on the upper end. It's interesting to see how his base responds to that. He's going to have some clashes with state leadership about some of the things he wants to do on the fiscal front. Uh, he's coming in with an agenda that's really unlike anything we've seen in New York in a couple of decades. All right, let's get back to the big picture here in terms of all of these races. We know President Obama put out the calls last night to the winners, including McAuliffe and de Blasio, but apparently he didn't call Chris Christie. Are we supposed to read into this? Yeah, it's interesting. He called uh, he called only Democrats who won big races last night. Now, the White House says that uh, that's in keeping with what he's done in previous elections. Chris Christie got his congratulatory uh, phone call four years ago, the day after the election. They have not said whether he's going to get a phone call today. I thought that was interesting. I, I, had, I had not heard of this precedent before. Bet on me if I didn't know about it going back generations or something. But the idea that there aren't that many races on the ballot last night. And, and traditionally, an election day is a time to heal divisions, to reach out across party lines is a lot of heady talk about bipartisanship and postpartisanship, what it would take to make a phone call to the one other person that won a big race last night, it would not have been significant uh, as an investment of time. So I, I thought it was an oversight. Um, it certainly glared out at me when I saw the White House statement describing the phone calls the president made last night. And Rick, you talked about the victory of Terry McAuliffe in Virginia possibly being a repudiation of the Tea Party. Do we get a sense of that in any of these other races? There's one other one where that really became paramount, and that was in a, a little-noticed House race down in Alabama, in the Mobile area. There was an open seat for a congressional 
uh, district is heavily Republican. The Republican primary, which the runoff was yesterday, that is tantamount to the general election. And there was an establishment candidate running, and he's running as a Tea Party challenger. And it got to the point where the establishment was so concerned about this Tea Party or that the Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, that is, the National Rifle Association, got involved in this little itty-bitty primary down in Alabama, uh, this one-off of a primary. And they ended up saving the day for the establishment candidate. And I, there's a bunch of Republicans that I've been in contact with today who feel like, this shows at least there's a way to right the ship, that it's not uh, it, it's not a foregone conclusion that a Tea Party candidate is just going to roll over the person that is more of the mainstream choice of Republicans. All right, ABC News political director Rick Klein, thank you so much for joining us. Always fun to go through election night uh, with you. Love it when voters vote. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, you've been watching an ABC News digital special report. I'm Ty Hernandez in New York.